Since I came back to the UK, I've had a bit of an obsession and it's all to do with finding these signs. So pretty much in any graveyard anywhere over the UK, you're going to find one of these signs, the Commonwealth War Graves. So a couple of weeks ago, I came out for a hike in a place called Chislehurst, not too far away from where I grew up. So we parked here just by a church called St Nicholas. And as I was getting out of the car, immediately I spotted this Commonwealth grave which is for a chap called R. Brown. He was in the Pioneer Corps and he passed away in 1941. But as I looked just behind, it's not a Commonwealth grave, but there is a word that jumped out at me, basically, pilot, pilot officer. And this is the grave of a chap called Derek John Fielder. And he actually died in 1940. So immediately I was thinking as I passed by, 1940 pilot officer, could he be one of the few? And I'm not going to lie, researching one of the few would have been a real pleasure for me. And I thought about this guy all the way around my hike and as I came back, I had to have another look. I dragged my wife and little daughter into a graveyard to have a look and take a picture of this grave. As soon as I got home, I jumped onto my laptop and I went onto all the kind of genealogy sites that I um, have subscriptions to, so Ancestry, um, um, Find the Past, these kind of things. So I looked and in fact, um, obviously he wasn't one of the few. He died on the 28th of December, 1940 so a little bit outside that Battle Britain sort of timeline. But the story I uncovered was much more interesting. Sure, Derek John Fielder is kind of an ordinary chap. He's not the kind of guy that you would ordinarily make um, a YouTube video about. He's not one of the dam busters. He's not, uh, you know, he's not part of any of those fancy stories you normally see. But for me, what I uncovered was deeply personal, and extremely interesting. So this is going to be the story of Derek John Fielder and the reason why he's buried here when he really shouldn't be. Derek Fielder was not, as I had first imagined, a fighter pilot. He'd actually been the navigator on a cramped Hamden P2097 attached to 83 Squadron. By December 1940, Fielder and his other crew members were in just an elite group as the few who had defended Britain that summer. Bomber Command was now the only offensive weapon the Allies had to fight back against the German onslaught. Another two pieces of tantalising information came up in my initial search, which absolutely fascinated me. As soon as I found out the aircraft's serial number, I was quickly able to identify the other members of Fielder's crew, if any, that had also died that day. Unfortunately, when I punched in P2097 into the International Bomber Command Centre's website, it came back with four results. In addition to pilot officer Derek Fielder, Flight Lieutenant Rooney and Sergeants Hunt and Whalen were also killed on the 28th of December 1940. Sad as this was, what surprised me was that they weren't all to be found buried in Chislehurst with pilot officer Fielder. In fact, these men who died in the notoriously confined bowels of Hamden were separated in death by hundreds of miles. So what I discovered is that while pilot officer Fielder is actually buried here in Chislehurst in South London, his pilot, Flight Lieutenant Rooney, and his wireless operator, who was Sergeant Hunt, they're actually buried in a place called Benson, which is quite near RAF Benson. But their air gunner, Sergeant Whalen, is actually buried far up north in Cumbria. So my question was, why were these men separated in death? The other interesting nugget that came up in my research became incredibly personal to me. It was their target that night. So who was Derek John Fielder? Derek John Fielder was born on the 17th of June 1916 to John Fielder, a commercial traveller, and Ethel Drilder, Ely Rind, and he was welcomed home by his two-year-old sister Joyce. By the eve of the Second World War, Derek was living with his father in Wimbledon as a printing engineer. John Fielder had become a widower the same year, and the records strongly suggest the two men were living as lodgers with the bowlers on 23 Cambridge Road. His sister Joyce seems to have been married by this point and living elsewhere. By the time the information for the 1939 register had been collected, Derek was already a member of the RAF Volunteer Reserve, ready to serve his country in the time of crisis. So Derek was a Londoner, but that's not what the records originally suggested. For many years, he had been put down as a Rhodesian. This was a complete red herring. But after some digging and help from the Bomber Command Research Facebook group, I'm sure we've established Derek's true identity. Now, when I first stumbled across Derek's grave, I had hoped he would be a pilot. 
Having trained as one myself, it's the aircrew role I most identify with. After some research, it appears that Derek did actually undertake flight training. He passed through the 6 FTS and gained his wings in October 1939 and was then transferred to 14 OTU. What followed was several months of rapid training in all the skills he'd need as an operational pilot. This led to the then sergeant fielder being at the controls of a Hereford L6016 on the 9th of May 1940, which he crashed during a training exercise. Escaping major injury, Derek was then commissioned as pilot officer on probation on the 18th of June 1940. It was around this time that Derek married Irene or Reenie Brown. While he had been living on Cambridge Road, Wimbledon, Reenie was just around the corner on Coombe Gardens. Sadly, this wartime romance would end in the same way so many others would. The newly gazetted pilot officer continued his operational training, moving to the Hamden variant, then the main aircraft operated by Five Group. It's while training on this type that another of those strange coincidences and connections to me came up. At 20.20 hours, while on a routine night exercise on the 5th of October 1940, in poor weather, Hamden P2072 struck the ground near Howe Talon on Barnum Moor. The aircraft crashed into a stone wall and then quickly caught fire. The crew scrambled to safety, waiting in a hunting lodge until rescued. This aircraft was being piloted by pilot officer Fielder, who again escaped without injury, along with wireless operator Sergeant Albert Charles White. The other men aboard were not quite so lucky, with wireless operator Sergeant Reginald Wilfred Gray breaking his ankle, and second pilot Sergeant Andrew Ogilvy Hawes breaking his leg. For those of you that don't know, my name is Phil Hawes, which is not a very common surname. I'm not sure how closely related I am to Andrew Hawes, but it's just one of those things that drew me to the story of Derek Fielder. Thankfully, Sergeant White and Andrew Hawes would survive the war. Andrew would pass away in September 1995 in Johannesburg, survived by his daughter Sylvia and wife Renee. Or is that Rini? Sergeant Gray was not as fortunate and gave his life on the 31st of August 1941 when he was shot down in a 207 squadron Manchester over Cologne. He was just 19. By November 1940, Derek Fielder had been posted to 83 squadron. However, he would not fly any operations as a pilot and skipper, instead acting as an observer in the navigator role. This may not have been down to him being washed out as a pilot. Until quite late into 1942, Hamdens were accrued up with a reserve pilot who also took on the navigator's tasks. Difficult as it was by pushing the pilot seat back, other crew members were able to remove an incapacitated skipper and take over. This idea seems to have been abandoned later, and Hamdens received a dedicated navigator from then on. But this does throw up an interesting thought I'll cover later. The next question was, what would it have been like entering 83 Squadron in late 1940? What was this Hamden Squadron doing during this significant first year of the war? And for that matter, what was RAF Bomber Command up to while a grateful nation was singing the praises of Fighter Command? Honestly, the more I read, the more intrigued I became. 83 Squadron got off to a rather slow start despite having aircraft bombed up and ready for the off from the first day of the war. Nearly eight months of coastal patrols and scrub missions faced these crews, who spent considerable time up in Scotland. It wasn't until April 1940 that the squadron really went into action in the offensive role. During this period, 83 Squadron, like the rest of Bomber Command, were restrained by Britain's promise to the American president, FDR. This vow stated that Britain and its ally France would not intentionally attack targets that could result in civilian casualties. This limited Bomber Command to maritime targets and propaganda raids. It's astounding that men were sent to risk their lives in 1939 and 1940 just to drop leaflets on the enemy. 83 Squadron was no exception. At the start of April 1940, 83 Squadron began carrying out gardening missions. This was the code word for mine laying operations across Europe. These hazardous flights were many a crew's introduction to war flying. The Hamden proved to be ideally adapted to this type of work. In the same month, the squadron launched its first bombing raid, directed against the Danish airfield at Alsborg. With the German offensive in the west on the 10th of May 1940, 83 Squadron joined attacks on oil refineries in Hamburg. 
and in July the squadron was involved in the first attempts on the Dortmund Ems Canal aqueducts. As the intensity of the missions mounted, so did the casualties. 76 men from 83 Squadron would perish by the end of November 1940. That's out of a total of 2,894 men across Bomber Command. As the nature of the conflict changed, targets that might result in civilian collateral were authorised. Running up to December 1940, 83 Squadron was sent on attacks in France, Germany and the Lowlands. During this time, the men of 83 Squadron battled against flak, night fighters and particularly the weather. While all of them need to be praised and remembered, two particular names have to be mentioned. Gibson and Hannah. Guy Gibson was a member of 83 Squadron from the beginning of the war right until 1940. By no means the household name that he would become just three short years later, he no doubt had an impressive record. Looking at the mission reports, it reads like a grocery list. Gibson and his regular crew, namely Pilot Officer Watson, Sergeant McCormack and Sergeant Howard, carried out several of the hazardous gardening sorties with their flower and vegetable co-names. He was also on many of the first bombing raids against Germany herself, some of which were more successful than others. Whereas Gibson eventually operated with the same crew, when reading through the ORB, I noted that quite often crews would substitute members. I half hoped that there would be a Gibson connection with P2097. I confess it seemed more Hollywood. Nevertheless, there seems no direct connection between the boy and the crew of P2097, nor the aircraft itself. As Guy Gibson was transferred out of 83 Squadron, about the same time that Fielder, Rooney, Hunt and Whalen arrived, it's doubtful that they ever met. Still, his reputation and those of the crews that went before must have remained as these lads took up the fight against Germany. The other name that had jumped out at me will probably be familiar to you too, Sergeant John Hanna, or Sergeant John Hanna VC, as he should be known. His citation reads, On the night of the 15th of September 1940, Sergeant Hanna was the wireless operator, air gunner, in an aircraft engaged in a successful attack on an enemy barge concentration at Antwerp. It was then subjected to intense anti-aircraft fire and received a direct hit from a projectile of an explosive and incendiary nature, which apparently burst into the bomb compartment. A fire started which quickly enveloped the wireless operators and rear gunners' cockpits, and as both the port and starboard petrol tanks had been pierced, there was grave risk of the fire spreading. Sergeant Hanna forced his way through to obtain two extinguishers and discovered that the rear gunner had had to leave the aircraft. He could have acted likewise, through the bottom escape hatch or forward through the navigator's hatch, but remained and fought the fire for 10 minutes with the extinguishers, beating the flames with his logbook when these were empty. During this time, thousands of rounds of ammunition exploded in all directions and he was almost blinded by the intense heat and fumes, but had the presence of mind to obtain relief by turning on his oxygen supply. Air admitted through the large holes caused by the projectile made the bomb compartment an inferno and all the aluminium sheet metal on the floor of this airman's cockpit was melted away, leaving only the cross bearers. Working under these conditions, which caused burns to his face and eyes, Sergeant Hanna succeeded in extinguishing the fire. He then crawled forward, ascertained that the navigator had left the aircraft and passed the latter's log and maps to the pilot. This airman displayed courage, coolness and devotion to duty of the highest order, and by his actions in remaining and successfully extinguishing the fire under conditions of the greatest danger and difficulty, enabled the pilot to bring the aircraft to its base. Just a month before Hannah's brave actions, 83 Squadron's fellow Scampton-based neighbours, 49 Squadron, had also seen a VC awarded. This time, it was for the actions of Flight Lieutenant Roderick Learoyd in an action on the Dortmund Ems Canal. I can only imagine that arriving at Scampton and joining 83 Squadron in late 1940, these four men must have been both encouraged and humbled by the unit's war record so far. As I researched this crew more, I wanted to get an understanding of how a single bomber crew fit into the wider bomber offensive at the end of 1940. The honest truth was that bomber command in the first few years of the Second World War was a far cry from what it became by the time peace was declared. Of course, this was true of many air commands at the time. In 1940, crews were still two years away from the first truly heavy bombers. They were being asked to operate aircraft that were barely up to the task. Many of the types being flown were simply obsolescent. Modest flying speed 
even more modest defensive armament soon meant that Bomber Command adopted a strictly nocturnal schedule. Indeed, the 83 Squadron ORB clearly states in March 1940 that night flying training had been increased. In addition to the stopgap or unsuitable bombers, the crews didn't have the navigational aids that would be developed as the war dragged on. Successfully finding one's target relied on the most rudimentary navigational principles. It's also important to remember that the bloke sitting in the navigator's seat in 1940 might not necessarily be a bona fide navigator. This was very much the case for the last flight of P-2097. Another interesting factor to consider is that until as late as 1942, operational flights only benefited from the most basic level of planning. Often crews were simply told the target and the takeoff time, then left to their own initiative to find and destroy it, almost like something out of a Biggles story. So how did the crew of P-2097 fit into this, and especially Derek Fielder, who sparked off this research? The truth is that these blokes got bowled out before they really managed to get into the crease. Looking through the available records, 19-year-old Sergeant Hunt was the first in action, flying on his first sortie on the 15th of November to Hamburg, which was a resounding success. 22-year-old Sergeant Whalen flew his first mission the next day, with Hamburg also being the target, but the weather seriously hampered the operation. On the 20th of November, Pilot Officer Fielder, himself 24 years old, joined the crew of Sergeant Baxter for his first mission, which was a total success. Their target was the marshalling yards at Ruhrort. Sergeant Hunt was also on board the Hamden for this flight, which was, incidentally, P-2097. Sergeant Hunt almost bought it on the 26th of November when Hamden P-2125 crashed on takeoff. Luckily, the crew, including the 19-year-old, were able to get out of the pranked crate. Interestingly, Sergeant Hunt, along with Sergeant Wayland, would take part in one of the stranger roles Hamdens were used in during the winter of 1940, as night fighters. Joining the crew of X-2969, piloted by pilot officer Leister, the two sergeants were joined by another gunner, and the five-man crew were sent to patrol Bristol with three other 83 Squadron Hamdens. One twin-engine aircraft was briefly sighted, but nothing else was achieved. Flight Lieutenant Rooney, whose promotion from flying officer had just come through that month, flew his first mission with 83 Squadron on the 10th of December 1940 to Mannheim. He was flying 2nd Dickey with Sergeant Fox, who was, ironically, in command of Hamden P-2097. Rooney didn't fly again until the 19th of December when he was placed in command of X-3123. This was the first mission the four men flew together. Low cloud over the Cologne area meant that they were forced to bomb their target on dead reckoning. Based on the BUT report, no doubt they failed to hit the target. Two days later, three of the four men were flying again, this time in X-2969. During that sortie, they reported to have bombed flak installations at Dessau. However, for that mission, Sergeant Whalen had been replaced by another gunner, Sergeant Wade. By the time the four men climbed into P-2097 for its final flight, Pilot Officer Fielder had completed five sorties, Sergeant Whalen six, and Sergeant Hunt eight. Their pilot was on his third operational mission with the squadron. It seems that Flight Lieutenant Rooney was by far the most inexperienced man, However, when I dug a little deeper into Flight Lieutenant Rooney's background, I found out that the South African had actually started his training back in 1937. This is at odds with the conclusion of the accident report for P-2097. Something I'd fully expect from a novice pilot, but not one with nearly three years of flying experience. The other thing that really made the story of Pilot Officer Fielder and the crew of P-2097 special for me was its target for that night. It was Bordeaux. For me, this was again a bit of a coincidence. Not only had I lived in Bordeaux myself for several years, I even used to teach English at the very target 83 Squadron was sent to attack that night, Merinac Airfield, now the major airport in Bordeaux. It was home to Luftwaffe squadrons operating, among other types, the Focke-Wulf FW200 Condor. This was being used to great effect by the Germans in the Battle of the Atlantic, and disrupting these operations was essential. While many of the 83 Squadron Hamdens didn't find the target at all that night, Pilot Officer Royal and the crew of X-2972 did manage to bomb Bordeaux's docks. This is exactly where I used to live. So, there is a chance that Pilot Officer Fielder managed to find the airfield located on the Rive Gauche, some seven miles from the banks of the Gironde, I know so well. <laughs> 
I've even been up to the modern control tower and no doubt looked over the very location where P2097's bombs might have fallen all those years ago. I've even flown in the same skies as these men, operating from the small airfield just south of Bordeaux. It's these little connections that really bring this story to life for me. What is certain is that Pilot Officer Fielder navigated P2097 over Oxfordshire, where the weather falls to Hamden lower and lower. So here I am at Appleford in Oxfordshire, and it's around here, Appleford Bridge, which uh, it's not that easy to find, around here that the aircraft crashed and the accident report says that uh, there seemed to be no enemy action uh, damage or damage from um, flak or anything like that. So the cause of the crash is probably that the pilot, Flight Lieutenant Rooney, just flew into high ground. But if you look um, around here, it's pretty flat. So the weather must have been absolutely atrocious in December 1940 for him just to, to make impact with the ground. Um, so I don't know exactly where the aircraft crashed, but it's somewhere in this area, in these fields, uh, that these four men died. Having driven up to the location of the crash, noted as Appleford Bridge, I was quite surprised. Despite being fairly rolling countryside and not as flat as Lincolnshire, it doesn't seem to be somewhere that accidental impact with the ground would occur that often. Nevertheless, when you consider the weather they must have been facing in December 1940, this could explain the incident. It must have been a real pea super. Of 12 aircraft dispatched on various missions that night, only two reported definite success. Most experienced heavy cloud over their targets and were forced to attack secondary ones or bomb blind. That being said, P2097 was the only 83 Squadron aircraft lost that night. Only the crew of X3119 experienced similar tragedy, with Navigator Sergeant Turner being mortally wounded by flak, forcing the rear gunner to take over his duties for the return flight. Two other Hamdens also diverted to Boscombe Down due to the weather. The other cause is obviously battle damage, which might have forced P2097 into a situation that Flight Lieutenant Rooney could not have recovered from. Is there a chance that one or more of the crew were wounded? Could Pilot Officer Fielder have been forced to take the pilot's seat and subsequently crash due to his less than adequate flying skills? We will never know for sure. The accident report, however, places the blame at Rooney's door. As best as I can decipher, the final conclusion is pilot error. In basic terms, a controlled flight into terrain, which none of the crew survived. Flight Lieutenant Rooney, a native of Cape Town, was understandably buried near where he fell, just a row in front of Sergeant Hunt, a Dorset lad whose family opted to bury him among comrades. Flight Lieutenant Rooney would show up once more in my research where his estate was being settled in April 1942. He seemed to be alone and a very long way from home. Sergeant Whalen was claimed by his parents and finally buried in Penrith, Cumbria. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to travel that far north to pay my respects, yet. Pilot Officer Fielder was also claimed by his family, but was buried in Chislehurst. On his headstone, he's commemorated as a beloved nephew by his uncle, who lived in Grey's End. Originally, when I thought Derek to be a Rhodesian, this made a lot of sense. Family in the motherland would surely have taken care of him. However, I now believe that his uncle paid for a unique headstone because his father was unable to do so. This may have even happened after John Fielder's death in 1951. Rini Fielder, Derek's wife of just eight months, suffered more loss before the war was over. Her brother, James Wood Brown, was killed on a raid to Berlin on the 22nd of November 1943 while piloting at Halifax. Had he been inspired by his late brother-in-law to join the service? The trail for Rini Fielder, Nay Brown, goes cold after she boarded a ship at Southampton on the 18th of May 1948, bound for South Africa. Now, if this was a Hollywood movie, she would be the Renee or Rini who married Andrew Hawes, but that's just fantasy. Another coincidence is the grave of Private Robert Brown of the Pioneer Corps, who was laid to rest in front of Derek Fielder. Could he be a blood relative of Irene Brown? So for me personally, this random headstone I happened upon in a graveyard I'd ignored for years had some incredible links and coincidences that really brought Pilot Officer Fielder's story to life. So this is really dedicated to Pilot Officer Fielder and the rest of the crew of P2097 
and the sacrifice that they made. So if you've enjoyed this video and you want me to do similar videos in the future, if you've got any ideas of um, people that I can research and talk about, let me know in the comments and uh, why not go out and visit one of the graveyards yourself in your local area and see what stories are there and which stories you can share. Thanks for watching.